Hello everybody, Model Man Frank here. How you doing today? Um, sorry about some technical difficulties we had streaming our video. Um, if you haven't, if you just started watching, um, we had a couple of little problems here. We're going through the paces, trying something new, and it just came up wrong. So. Welcome to the show tonight. Tonight's show is going to be uh, about Boeing aircraft from 1920s. If you're watching this on playback, uh, you know, hopefully you like the way um, things are situated now. Uh, we're still working out a little bit of bugs here and there, and uh, we'll see how it goes. But uh, so, starting off the show. Just to let you guys know, if you're watching this again on playback, uh, please hit the like and subscribe button. If you're going to share it, make sure you uh, share it with some friends and uh, tell them, you know, to join us in our podcast here. Um, it's uh, every night, every Sunday night at 7.30 p.m., 4.30 Pacific time. Um, also, if you want to support the content that I put on here, please follow me up Whoa. Sorry, on that side. Uh, follow me here at uh, on Patreon, Model Man Frank, and you can follow me there for uh, other stuff that I put up. And uh, I put a little bit more exclusive stuff. I don't put it here on YouTube, so you'll be able to see me uh, putting things together and the books that I use and a little bit of content I put on and things like that. So, with that said, let's, uh, let's start the show. Um, one of the very first aircraft we're going to talk about today. Uh, so, basically what we're going to do here is we're going to be going uh, through some of the uh, uh, aircraft that Boeing first started out with. Uh, some of the aircraft that Boeing started off with was in the 19th. When, when they got into the commercial business, um, it was very early on. And they first started the business with, uh, like everybody else was doing, you know, they, 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 they started off with a aluminum uh, aircraft, but they wanted to make it right. They got into the military side of uh, building aircraft. But it was in the early times that they realized that building uh, commercial aircraft was a totally different thing. So the first plane we're going to start off is with the Model 80. Boeing built the Model 80. And it was a tri-engine design. You're gonna, I'm going to... And um, there's the Model 80. As you can see, it's got three engines. It's a biplane. It is that time of the, you know, they, they went with simplicity. They went with what people were used to seeing, which was a biplane configuration. And they put three engines on it. Um, there's other aircraft at the time that were built with the three engine design. Um, if you've seen some of my other videos, you'll notice that the Curtis, actually, I'm sorry, the three engine design with Fokker and with the Ford Tri-Motor. But this is really also the Stinson. Stinson put out an aircraft that was a three engine design and they also put out one that was also a, uh, a uh, biplane. So this first aircraft that came out, first flight was in August of 1928. Um, there were not that many built. Only uh, 16 of them flew. Um, passenger count on this aircraft was 12. There was only 12 persons on board this plane. And it was... There was only really one uh, customer, which was Boeing Transport Service, which actually, as a matter of fact, Boeing Transport Service... Boeing started... United Airlines and subsequently United Airlines was what became uh, what started from Boeing Transport Services. Um, some of these aircraft uh, lasted 
for a while. Um, they flew uh, commercial service for a little bit, and then they moved on to other aircraft. Of course, Boeing Transport Services moved on and started into the other uh, realms. Uh, this one, the 16 that were uh, still available, moved on to other, uh, you know, other uh, uh, commercial success with flying in Alaska and so on. There's only one left. Um, if you ever get a chance to go to the Seattle Air Museum in uh, Boeing Field, you can see one. And uh, I got one here in our list of images. Um, they did a good job restoring it. You'll never see one of these aircraft in the air again. Um, finding it as a remote control, you would actually have to make your own set of plans. Um, I tried looking the web up and down, looking for an airplane that actually had a, um, uh, that there was a plane that could be, or a set of plans that could be made into a, uh, an actual suitable remote control, but I just couldn't find any. So the only one left is, it's painted rather beautifully. It's at the Boeing, um, Field uh, Air Museum, and it's it's very nice. Uh, let's show you what it looks like here. Um, let me just give you. Again, we're working through the bugs here, and that's the picture of the aircraft there. You can see it right there, and um, it's it's a rather beautiful plane. Uh, the colors they chose were green and silver, which were the colors that you know they had when they were in service and um again the airplane has a, there's no actual flying style of that aircraft anywhere left there's only one left that's surviving and it is in an air museum it's quite sad that we just won't see anything flying of this model i i i wonder what it sounded like it probably sounded more like a ford tri-motor than anything had same had the same engines on it and uh, that was the Boeing Model 80. So that was Boeing's very first attempt at building an airliner. Our second aircraft uh, that Boeing uh, got into was a more of a relatively different approach than a biplane. Um, Boeing had built a bomber with a, a a single wing they got away from building biplanes like you know the model 80 and they tried a different approach so they already had stuff that was on the shelf and they were already producing a bomber with this same wing I'm sorry this way <laughs> This is the Model 247. Um, the wings on the aircraft, if you see the here, okay, are the same ones from one of the bombers they had built. So the fuselage was also the same, tail surfaces, uh, the motors are also the same, and the aircraft had the same retractable landing gear. Uh, for this aircraft, the first flight was February 8th of 1933. So relatively, almost right after their, the 1928 August flight of the Model 80, uh, this one first flew. Um, so probably you're looking at five years, five years from then? Um, eight years. No, five years, I'm, co I'm correct. Five years. And um, the 247, as it was known, okay, the, Bo the Boeing 247, was a revolutionary design. It was uh, all aluminum. All the services were, and you could carry the same amount of passengers, 12 passengers inside the aircraft. Um, it had a retractable landing gear, but it lacked in speed. At the same time this aircraft was coming out, DC, the Douglas DC-2 was also making its first flight. And it had different approach on this one. This one 
fell hard kind of commercially. It didn't do very well in sales. Um, Boeing Air Transport was the very first company to actually buy the aircraft. Uh, I'm so sorry. Um, so Boeing Aircraft Services were the first ones to... Uh, and then National Park Airlines. I'm not too sure too much about that airline. But National Park Airlines was around. And, um, bear with me right moment, right, sir, here, National Park Airlines, let's see what we can find out about National Park Airlines, so National Park Airlines came out, and then Penn Central Airlines, United Aircraft Airlines, which was United Airlines, uh, Wayne Air Alaska, uh, Western Air Express, Wyoming Air Services, and Woodley Air. So those were the, the airlines that were around at that time. Um, the power plant that was on this aircraft, it was two Pratt & Whitney's producing 550 horsepower. Uh, there were WASP radials. Only 60 were built of this, exa this uh, example. Only a few handful are left. Uh, the one that's most notably is the one that's at the National Air and Space Museum in, uh, in Washington, D.C. And this aircraft actually had a lot of firsts. Um, it was the first 247 required a, to require a... Uh, It had a steward on board. I didn't know how to explain. A steward is basically a flight attendant. The steward on board was a stewardess because uh, men were not in that role yet. Um, not like in the modern day eras that are now. Now men and women work together uh, serving drinks and, and lunches and meals and so on on board the flights. This aircraft did not have that. This aircraft actually had a, f a flight attendant who was female, and she would be the ones dishing out just small meals, uh, maybe even coffee, maybe a, some water. But you really didn't get a full meal as you were going to get on later flights and later airlines later on in the uh, decades to come. Um the aircraft had a couple of setbacks in it. Um, Douglas saw these weaknesses and actually exploited them in their DC-2. The 247, as this one is known, had a the wings the wing spar went right through the center portion of the fuselage, and I think I have a photo here to show you guys so you can see what the interior of the 247 is because. It was rather cramped. Um, if you thought flying on Spirit Airlines was cramped, this was much worse and probably a little louder um, in terms of uh, uh, comfort. Um, the 247 was a 1-1 configuration, and it was the first aircraft to actually have a breakaway from the pilot. In other words, you had a separate area from the pilot. The pilot would crawl into its own, his own little cabin and he would fly the plane. Of course, the door was open. It's not like today where the door's closed and locked and has a, you know, you're behind a fence. And, uh, and yes, you had cigarettes on board, exactly. Um, probably did have peanuts. We never know. So... This aircraft, I'm going to show you what the interior is. Hold on to your seats here. That's how quiet, how crowded it was. If you look right in the middle of the seat, yes, boys and girls, that is the wing root. That is your wing spar going through the cabin. So as the pilot, so you weren't going through this uh, this cabin with a um, with a uh, with a drinks cart, 
because you want to be able to go over the wings bar. So, you know, the person would come by, she would bring you drinks individually if you wanted one or a bag of peanuts or maybe some potato chips or something like that. Uh, so if the guy next to you was bothering you or anything like that, too bad. You didn't have any other seat to be moved to. There was no first class. It was all, this aircraft was first class. To buy a ticket on these airlines, it was expensive. Um, you flew, you were dressed in business attire or women were dressed in dress. There were no slacks at the time um, and so on. Um, but yeah, that's basically what you, what you remember. And yeah, there were probably ashtrays on board. So they're... Uh, they, they, you could actually see that there were seat belts on board the plane, but it was very cramped, and there was no bathroom. So, they were short haul planes. They were short haul flights. You weren't going very far in them. And uh, uh, if the person in front of you passed gas, you smelled it. So, just a little tidbit of information on that one. Next one we're going to is a very revolutionary aircraft. And Boeing built this plane. It was a new type of aircraft for them. Completely out of the box. And just all around revolutionary aircraft. Revolutionary design altogether. Um, let's see if I can get it up here so you can see it. It was a beautiful plane. Um, there is one example that flew for a little while and it was no longer, it went into the air museum. A uh, little background, this is the Boeing 307. The Boeing 307 was a revolutionary design. Um, it could fly, um, you know, at altitudes of 20,000 feet. Um, the aircraft was built with the wings of the Boeing Seven, um, the Boeing B-17, as we all know from World War II. This is the Model 307. If many of you look at it, it has square windows. Now, something very interesting about this plane. This aircraft was built, the first flight of this aircraft was December 31st of 1938. So, this plane came out before any jets were out. But something interesting about this aircraft is that it was pressurized. Now, as we learned from the last... Um, uh, aircraft that we talked about last week, the de Havilland Comet, also had a pressurized cabin, but it was flying a lot higher. This aircraft had an altitude of 20,000 feet, so you were above the uh, clouds per se, but you weren't flying into the stratosphere, so you weren't, uh, you know, having too much. This aircraft here had four engine it was a four engine design well spaced out cabin for a plane of this size it 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 carried um oops excuse me i'm sorry i'm reading from notes here so pan am this is the pan am clipper um the one that we're seeing here there were three of the pan am aircraft that were built Model number, you're, you're going to find this hilarious. Model number 1995, okay, built in 1938, was the Clipper Rainbow. There was the Clipper Comet and the Clipper Flying Cloud. Uh, Clipper Comet's uh, serial number, bureau, uh, construction number, was 2002. And then the Clipper Flying Cloud's construction number is 2003. So, 
their birth dates passed. Um, there are there sh there is one that is actually being res that's going to be restored from what I've been told, and it was actually a somebody's houseboat for a while. Uh, Kermit Weeks of Weeks Aviation and Fantasy of Flight and Polk County Airport has acquired it, and he is planning to restore it to original beauty. We'll see how that goes. Um, the The aircraft was a boat, and it was on the water for a very long time, so it's probably uh, to see that that aircraft is going to have to go through extensive uh, renovations. Um, this aircraft, like I said, 10 of the 307s were built, one of which the prototype crashed. The prototype was actually flying along and there was something that happened with the aircraft. And it uh, crashed. It was a setback for the company in that aspect. Let me see if I can get you some photos here of the, uh, the 307 crash site. But, uh, yeah, you know, the aircraft, it, it handled uh, some bad setbacks in that time period. Sorry about that. That's a little big for me. It's going, like I said, it's, it's a whole new program that I'm using here to show you photos instead of flipping up the book and showing you a photo. No one survived. The pilots perished in the, uh, in the incident. Um... There were, uh, so of the 16, now there's 15 aircraft left. Um, Howard Hughes owned one, and he was the one that owned that aircraft that was actually turned into a fly, uh, a houseboat on water. Um, it sat, the Howard Hughes' aircraft actually sat outside in the desert for a while, and then somebody got a hold of the aircraft and turned it into a houseboat. The military version was the C-75. So Pan Am, Transcontinental Airlines, which be later became TWA, uh, U.S. Army Air Forces, and Al Arzur, which is a very long, is a very old airline, um, been flying since after the 40s, uh, since after the world after World War II. It's a French-based airline, and they fly around the French Riviera and different destinations over in Europe. Um, so this aircraft was also known as the straddle liner. Um, something very interesting about this plane is that the aircraft had same wings, same uh, tail surfaces, same engines, same wheels. The only difference was the fuselage was different. So I don't have a picture of the the layout of the inside, but I can assume that the inside was I think a two one configuration. So you had two passengers on one side and one passenger on the other. Excuse me. It was a beautiful, beautiful plane. Beautiful to look at. It just really stood out on the field. Um, it, you were, you looked like you were flying in a space age type of aircraft. So that is the plane right there sitting on a tarmac. Actually, I believe that's in California or in Seattle. Um, it was just the the pieces that you see around the engine cowling that was actually to help in the cooling process the one that crashed actually had a problem they found a fatal flaw at 20,000 feet that the engine if the engine uh, would cool down too much it would end up seizing so they put these fins in front of the aircraft to keep the engine uh, would be able to keep the engine warm but wouldn't cool too much. 
um, in that aspect. Um, the aircraft did not suffer many of the problems that uh, the Air Comet uh, from last week's show uh, suffered from, which was the blowout uh, of pressurization at, a cer at 38,000 feet. Since this aircraft flew at a lower altitude, yes, you were able to sit in the cockpit and be a little bit more comfortable, but you weren't flying at a higher altitude, so there was not as much pressure to be regulated. So, but as you can see, this aircraft had the same tail, the wing surface of the engine, and the landing gear. If you if that landing gear, you can actually look at some pictures, and you'll be able to see that landing gear. That landing gear is. Uh, reminiscent of that aircraft um, moving along here I just want to show you one more picture of the 307 which I do have in its military configuration and do I have a cross section I do not I'm going to show you the military version Painted up in olive drab green. The olive drab green one, the C-75, uh, that's the C-75 right there. So World War II happens, um, you know, it's 1938. So the war just starting in 1939. And... Um, it, uh, it, it's, it's, it's happening as you speak of what's going on. So, as things are going on, the, the beat of war drums are happening. Um, <laughs> as you can see, the plane actually loses its, its cooling uh, cooling uh, those little panels that were in the front of the engine. Um, it also uh, you can still see you can actually see the landing gear there as for the B twenty nine. So you're losing that, but it also has the door in the front cockpit. So that is actually the cargo area. And they would actually have cargo in the back also of the aircraft. So the aircraft, in its military form, I think it probably only traveled probably as high as 10,000 feet. Uh, or maybe 9,000 feet. So it was lower, lower to the ground. But it was a fast plane. Um, the, it, it flew at the same speed as the... Uh, the B-17. I gotta. Let's take a look at what their speed is for this aircraft, so I can give you an accurate description. Because, like I say, you know what I've always said: books are better. Books, your information is raw, and it's a better understanding of what is going on in the world when you have a book. News is different. You know, news you're going to read always online. But if you have books, you're going to get more information. Uh, the engines I know were the Wright Cyclone 1200 horsepower. There were four of them producing um, a good amount of horsepower on this aircraft. Uh, 45,000 pounds max uh, gross takeoff. And um, this aircraft could travel at a pretty good cleat. You had 33 seats on board, including your flight, your flight stewardess. 220 miles an hour. Pretty fast for 1938. It was a very beautiful plane. Um, there's not that many uh, RC versions of this. You can't really find any. There's only one company, William Brothers, that actually built a, uh, a model of it in plastic form. Uh, William Brothers doesn't exist anymore, uh, but you could probably find this kit online uh, through eBay. Um, so if you're looking to build a plastic model of this kit, 
Um, yeah, try eBay. eBay would be your best bet for that. So moving right along, as we are, we're going to move towards another airplane. We're now starting to expand our horizons when it came to the airline business. Everybody wanted to go farther. They wanted to go a little faster and not have to stay in the air for such a long time. The problem was is that a lot of the planes that I'm showing to you right now, you had to take off. And then when you got towards a, an area that you couldn't fly anymore, you had to land. And then you would be put up in a hotel. So you would spend the night in a hotel and then head on to your next destination. And then if you were flying across the country, it was a longer flight. Probably would take about a day or so to make the whole flight to two days, depending on the weather. Uh, there were sleeper versions of the uh, uh, straddle cruiser uh, of the 307 and there were th sleeper versions of other aircraft like the DC-2 and the DC other uh, DC aircraft but when it came to flying across the Pacific or the Atlantic you had to take a different form of transportation whether you had to take a boat and that would lead to about a week's travel or five days I think the fastest one was uh, the Queen Mary traveling across the ocean, and it was about five days you were able, you were already in Europe. But, of course, you know, you had a cabin, and you had... So they wanted to bring... So Pan American went to Boeing and said, listen, we want to bring that, that, that allure of traveling across the, the ocean, and we want to bring it on the plane. So could you guys build us an airplane? And Boeing said, yeah, we'll build you a plane. We'll build you a really, I mean, it will be the baddest looking airplane you've ever seen. And um, Boeing came out with a seaplane that was about the size it was it was the 747 of the time. It was the biggest thing flying in commercial aviation. Besides the Lufthansa aircraft, which we'll talk about that, the, the DO-17, I believe it was. This was the American version. It was prettier. People already started lining up in droves to purchase the aircraft. But war was on the horizon. And war would bring that dream of that aircraft, making it impossible. This is the Boeing 314, the Clipper. This was the 747 of Boeing of the 1930s. Um, there were 12 examples. The very first one you see here is the prototype. And if you look at that tail, there's no triple tail. When the Boeing 314 first flew, it had a single tail, tail, single tail fin. As the flights progressed, they realized, let's put more tails. So they put the two tails out on the winglets and on the rear tail and made it a triple tail. It added to the stability and the yaw and pitch of the aircraft. It was the flying boat. I mean, this was more like a flying ocean liner. So, being that Boeing saw that, they wanted to capitalize on that airliner slash boat liner or ship liner experience. Uh, on this aircraft, you would get two meals or three meals, depending on how long the flight was. You were flying across the, uh, the Pacific, and you were going to be treated in the lap of luxury. This was basically like flying on the Concorde. The only difference was is that you were going fast. I mean, uh, not sorry, not going fast. You were going slower. Uh, Concorde was, of course, Mach 2. This thing would never fly at Mach 2. There are 12 examples of this aircraft built. Let me show you a cross-section of what the aircraft looked like on the inside of the plane. 
and it was magnificent inside. It was really a pretty plane. Um, you had uh, a really beautiful setup inside. It was a double decker. So, I'm going to zoom it in here so you can actually see what we're looking at. You don't really have to see my face all this time. All right? So, what you're looking at here is a double decker aircraft. On the, bo on the first level is where you would get in, and you actually had seating for up to 12. There were 74 passengers. There was a, uh, a galley, so your full meals could be prepped. There was a smoking room. There was an area where you could just sit there and have your dinner, like a dining room area. There was um, uh, sleeping quarters on board the plane. And where the flight deck, where the cabin crew sat, you actually had radio on board. So if you needed something like a, like a transmission to be sent, you could go there and have the transmission sent. It would be up on the other decks. If you look at it, you can actually see a person in the engine room. Yes, it actually had the cord of the wing was had a door. You could service the engines while the aircraft was in flight. So they had an engineer on board the plane. And the aircraft had enough fuel for a flight to take off from San Francisco and fly nonstop to Hawaii. You would do a stopover in Hawaii, and then you would fly on to Wake Island. Um, in this version here, you could actually either you would either fly into Wake Island or you fly all the way to uh, to Japan. But the problem was is a lot of things were going on in Japan, so you were going to fly into China. Uh, if you were this was your ticket to the Orient. Um, for Atlantic flight travel, you were flying from New York's LaGuardia Airport on the water. You were taken off in Queens Bay, and you would fly across the Atlantic to Europe. The aircraft was beautiful. Um, it unfortunately, the twelve examples, not one exists today. They were all you uh, lost to crashes or they were lost to history where they were scrapped. Um, the wingspan on the aircraft was 152 feet. Height of this aircraft from the hull. Now this aircraft didn't have wheels on it. Um, to pull them in and out of the water you basically put it on a dolly and you pulled it up out of the water and that's how you serviced it or you serviced it out in the bay. Uh, the height to the tail was 27 feet. The length of the body was 106 feet. The Army and the Navy knew this aircraft as the C-98. And um, Pan Am, British Airways, which is British Overseas Air Corps, and the U.S. Navy were all customers of this aircraft. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt took this one of these aircraft all the way to a meeting in Malta, and uh, I think it was a meeting in Ireland also that he flew on one of these aircraft. First flight for this aircraft was June 7th of 1939. Max airspeed on this aircraft was 193 miles an hour. Um, she had four Pratt & Whitney R1830s, producing 1,500 horsepower each. Um, the, of the 74 passengers, you were all in separate cabins. Each cabin had a door, so if the aircraft was sitting in the water and produced a hole, you could actually close off that, just like in a ship. Um, this aircraft was very... There's actually one left. Uh, well, I'm sorry, there was no one left. In Ireland somebody actually reproduced the interior of this aircraft. Um, they have it at a museum. That's the only one you could actually see and look at. 
Um, now, trying to build a model of this plane, unfortunately, there there's not much in terms of models of this aircraft. Um, so, Boeing aircraft built 12 built the 12 examples right and here is what the aircraft compared to a 747 that's the size of the aircraft so that silhouette that you see in the background of that picture is actually the size of the aircraft compared to a 747 it was the 747 of that time period um, gonna give you guys a little breakdown here out of the out of the uh, the book the book that I'm using tonight and the photos that came from this book is a very hard book to find nowadays it's called uh, uh, Pan Am an airline and its aircraft and uh, that's the book right there. And um, so 74 seats at 180, ho at 180 miles per hour. Um, her max gross takeoff was 82,500 pounds. And she could fly 3,500 statue miles. So the aircraft that... Boeing gave to Pan Am the aircraft was the Honolulu Clipper which was construction number 1988 construction hull number 1989 was the California Clipper construction number 1990 is the Yankee Clipper construction hull number 1991 was the Atlantic Clipper Hull number 1992 was the Dixie Clipper, and hull number 1993 was the American Clipper. The Honolulu Clipper was sunk at sea by the U.S. Navy in 1945. Nobody knows what happened. Of course, only the Navy knows, and I'm sure they won't really let anybody know what happened. Um, the remnant, uh, the California Clipper was renamed the Pacific Clipper, uh, purchased by War Assets Department in 1946, sold to World Airways, and then scrapped in 1950. Um, the Yankee Clipper inaugurated first transatlantic mail service from New York to Marcellus. On 20 May 1939, first air mail routes from New York to Southampton on the 24th of 1939. And in 1943 of uh, February, she sank in Lisbon. She sank right off the coast of Lisbon. Um, some say that you can still see the, the hull in, off of the coast of Lisbon underwater. Um... The, the Atlantic Clipper, I'm reading this from this book here, inaugurated first transatlantic passenger service from New York to Marseille on 28 June 1939. It was sold to World Airways and then scrapped in 1950. So, you know where this is going. And the last one, which was the American Clipper, was purchased by the War Assets Department, sold to World Airways, and then scrapped in 1950. No warbirds of this aircraft that exist, nothing at the Air Museums, just photos and some models that really exist. Um, but it was a revolutionary aircraft at the time, and when they talk about seaplanes, they most definitely show the Boeing 314. Whatever documentary you see about the plane, you see it 
the Boeing 314. Moving right along, we're going to move on to our last aircraft. The war is over. Everybody's going back to flying. And everybody wants to travel in style. They want that seating, just like in the Model 314. We're going into the Model 377. So, I'm actually going to cut the Model 377. We're going to actually continue this in Part 2 of Boeing. Because we're going into a little bit of overtime here. And uh, we, we just don't have enough time to make the video as enjoyable. I really would like to make it longer, but as we did last time... We had a little bit too much fun. So the Model 377 was what we'll start with with our next podcast next week in uh, Boeing Part 2. I appreciate all that joined us tonight. Um, EMV Mends the Root as our moderator. Thank you for moderating for me. Um, if you guys get a chance, check out our page. And um, we will catch you guys on the next one. Next week, we will do Boeing Part 2. Uh, we'll talk about the history of Boeing. We'll start with the 377, and we will move on into the 1960s and 1970s. And we'll most likely we'll have a Part 3 because um, some of the aircraft that flew in the, uh, in the 70s and 80s, I flew on, and um, my my family flew on and I have a lot of memories of that aircraft so then again also if you're watching this on playback please hit the thumbs like button if you can give me two thumbs up that'd be great and if you want to support the content I really would appreciate go to my patreon page and subscribe and you will see more content I have a lot of things going on in this noggin of mine that I want to do for us here on this page. And uh, Sun and Fun is coming up. I will have some videos out about that. Again, have a good night, everybody. Thanks for joining in. Model Man Frank out. We'll talk to you all later. Mm -hmm.